time of worship and communion and fellowship and family. So glad we get to do this together. <laughs> it takes the body of Christ sometimes to speak to us, to pull us out of the pit, to tell us who we are, and we need to do that more. Amen? We need to prophesy to one another more. Sometimes it's easier to hear the voice of the Lord coming from someone else than it is to hear it internally. Amen? And it just breaks through and cuts through the fog, and we go, oh yeah, that's who I am. And then when someone else is hearing and believing for that, it's such a precious thing. So I'm so grateful, as Mike was mentioning just in communion, for the body of Christ. Praise Jesus that we're not in this alone. <laughs> so I'm excited to, uh, to teach. I was feeling last week, I, I, knowing that I was teaching and just starting to ask the Lord, what are you doing? And I was feeling this passage of Matthew chapter 11. And, um, and quite honestly, I've never preached through Matthew chapter 11. I've heard it preached and I've, and I've been in it a lot and it's spoken to me. But I, I was realizing I've never preached on these verses. And, um, and so I was feeling a little inadequate with that when, you, when the Lord leads you to something new. And you're like, well, maybe I could... Just do something I've done, Lord, because that's a little easier. <laughs> but last week, um, it just through a series of events, it got confirmed, Matthew chapter 11. And it's right in the same vein that we've been in with Proverbs chapter 3 and then Andrew's word of running to the Lord even when it, it doesn't look right. It's backwards concerning the ways of the world that we would sit on the backside of Bethlehem and sing to God and that he would choose us as a king over his people to lead his people from that place. And all of those wonderful analogies of David and Saul and then last week our encouragement of seek first, wait, no, ask, seek, knock. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. That is a verse. It's somewhere in the Bible. No. But we were encouraged to ask the Lord verbally to seek him, to posture our lives, to seek his face, to seek his heart. This is the generation of Jacob, the generation that will seek me. That's Psalm 24, ascending the hill of the Lord. And then to knock, to actually be obedient, to, to obey what we feel like the Lord is telling us to do. And so it's in that vein, Matthew chapter 11, um, so let's just dive in. If you want to open your Bibles, I tell you what, I love to, f I don't care who's preaching, I love to follow along in my Bible. I love to mark things, I love to, to I even, ha you know, maybe get a Word document out on my phone, I'm like, oh, cut and paste and cut and paste, but, but I love for my eyes to see it for myself. I, I love that we use the screens here, but I want to encourage you, open your Bible and follow along. That way when you go, oh yeah, what was that? You know exactly where to return to. Amen? And the book of Matthew, it's easy to find. It's the first book of the New Testament. I'm saying that to you because I'm having a hard time finding it right now. <laughs> there it is. All right. Matthew chapter 11. This is a grand crescendo. This, this chapter is going to take us to what the Lord has been speaking to us. This is Alignment Sunday. This is us coming to Jesus. And we had no idea that these words and, and this chapter was going to align like this. But, but this chapter, by the end of it, it's taking us to Jesus calling us, calling the nations, calling everyone to come to him and experience his rest and experience his wisdom and experience his ministry, to experience his humility, his gentleness, and to join ourselves to him, to yoke ourselves with him. His burden is light. It is easy. And so that's where we're going, and let's start with verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison 
about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples, verse 3, and said to him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, go tell John what you hear and see. Verse 5, the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. Okay, I'm going to do something funny right now. I forgot to spit out my gum, and it's bothering me, so I'm going to spit out my gum right here. Everyone knows that it's going to be right here, so hold me accountable. Matt, it's on your amp. Sorry. Is that okay? (laughs) And I also forgot to bring up my water, so can I have a water somewhere? Man, I'm just like, serve me, and I'm sorry, this is not, I was on my face before the Lord, there were so many good words, and then, thank you, buddy, sorry. All right. Woo! Okay, so if you've forgotten, John has sent his disciples to Jesus, and the question is, are you the one to come? Are you the Christ, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answers to him by saying this, John. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news preached to them. Now right here, Jesus is pointing to passages in the Old Testament that prophesy of what God is going to do when he encounters his people and what the Messiah is going to do when he encounters his people. Jesus, actually by each one of these phrases, is speaking to John passages in the Old Testament, and he's saying, John, what happened, or what was prophesied was going to happen, is happening now through my ministry. Let's look at some of these. These are amazing. Let's look at healing the blind, the lame, and the deaf. It says in Isaiah 35, verses 2 through 4, it says, it shall... Blossom abundantly, that's the desert. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. And the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord. That's Israel. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. And then Isaiah gets into an exhortation. Strengthen the weak hands. Strengthen the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not, Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with recompense of God. He will come and save you. So the majesty of God is what they're looking for, and God that is coming to save them is what they're looking for, okay? Now the next slide. Then, that's important then, and these are in parentheses, these are my parentheses. When your God comes to you and saves you, and when you see the glory of the Lord, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. So Jesus is saying, John, the glory of God, John, the God that is coming to save his people, John, I'm here. Blind eyes are being opened. The deaf are hearing. The lame are leaping. It says in there that Jesus doesn't say that the the tongue of the mute They're being opened so they can worship, so they can praise, so they can sing to me. And then Jesus says this phrase, and the dead are raised. Now, hold on. Just before you put up the slide, let me explain this. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 37, is taken by the hand of the Lord, and he's shown a valley of dry bones. And he says, prophesy, Ezekiel, to the valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel prophesies. And the bones come together and sinew come on the bones and muscles come together. But they're still not alive. And then the Lord commands Ezekiel, prophesy the breath in them. How fun would it have been to be Ezekiel during this, right? The Lord loves partnership. The Lord wants partnership. It would have been easy for God to do it himself, right? But he wanted Ezekiel to join in his prophetic ministry. I love that. I love the heart of God to partner with his people. So Ezekiel prophesies life into them. He prophesies to the four winds. He prophesies the breath of God, and they come alive. And then the word of the Lord is that 
the Lord says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Israel is saying that they are a valley of dry bones, that they are forgotten, and that they are cut off, which means they're cut off from the promises of God. And now this is in a pretty bad time. Nebuchadnezzar had just demolished Jerusalem in 586 BC. Daniel is in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, but they're all in exile. Daniel's in the court and Ezekiel's in the prison camp. I wonder if Ezekiel ever like talked to the Lord about that. (laughs) Hey, Lord, um, Daniel got, you know, like half of the kingdom and I'm in prison. (laughs) Just play. But they're contemporaries. They're two prophets of the same day, okay? And Ezekiel, the Lord is saying to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Israel is saying they're cut off, but they're not. I'm going to restore them. Now let's put up the slide. It says this, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves, and I will raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. Now, can you imagine when this started to happen in Israel? When the, the, widow's, the widow's son, the, the widow of Nain, and her son gets up as Jesus is walking by a funeral and just prays, and her son awakens. When Lazarus gets called out of the tomb, the grave is actually open. When Jesus dies on the cross and the graves are opened and they go into Jerusalem and they declare the wonder and the glory of God, Matthew 28, that really happened. Let's put that back up there just for a second. And it says, and I will put my spirit within you. So I wonder if they were ready for this. I wonder if, okay, the Messiah, he's... He's opening up the graves. Okay, now the Spirit's going to come. Isn't that glorious that it happened just like that? And I will put my Spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, that I have spoken, that I will do it, declares the Lord. So blind eyes are opening, the lame are leaping, and the dead are being raised. And all of these Old Testament prophecies are about God walking in your midst. Jesus is saying to John the Baptist's disciples, who would have known these scriptures really well, guys, think of these things. They're happening. God is in your midst. You don't have to wait for another. He says the lepers are cleansed. He says that 2 Kings 5, that, or 1 Kings, no, 2 Kings 5, the Naaman thing, where Naaman goes and dips in the river seven times, the commander of Syria, and he's cleansed of leprosy. He's like, that's happening. But what I love about lepers being cleansed is that the leper colonies in, in Israel, they were, they were the outcast of society. They had to obey Leviticus 13 and Leviticus 14. And if you had leprosy, you had to separate yourself. You couldn't be with your family. And also, you couldn't go into the temple to worship. So when Jesus starts making the unclean things clean, and they get to go into the temple, present themselves before the priests, I think the reason was Jesus was saying, I want all unclean things to be clean so they can worship the Lord. Now that right there, that what, how beautiful the heart of our God. How beautiful. He's restoring families by cleansing leprosy, and he's restoring worship to his father by this segregated group of people. And then it says this, and the poor have the good news preached to them. It says in Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Now, Jesus quotes this verse of himself in Luke 4. And after he quotes this, he rolls up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And he's telling that to John. John, the poor have the good news preached to them. The Isaiah 61 anointed one is in your midst preaching good news to the poor. 
Now, I love that Jesus chose to preach good news to the poor. Most of Jesus' public ministry was done in the region of Galilee. But the rich and the successful and the leaders of Israel lived in Judea and in Jerusalem. But Jesus said, I'm going to make my ministry center Capernaum, and I'm going to preach the good news to the poor of Israel. Is that not the heart of our God? I love he didn't set up this great public ministry in Jerusalem, in the temple. No, he does preach in Jerusalem. Most of the public exhortations of the book of John are from Jerusalem, and they're addressing uh, the leadership of Jerusalem. That's why he's so aggressive with them in John chapter 5 and in John chapter 8 and in John chapter 10. He's saying, you're not coming to me. You're saying you're sons of Abraham, but you're not coming to me. You're not responding to me. You're not responding to the Son of Man in your midst. And then he gets very aggressive with them. He says, you're actually of your father, the devil. Now, if you want a successful ministry in Jerusalem, that's probably not the thing to say. Jesus is not about building successful ministries. Jesus is about teaching and preaching the truth. We cannot be about building successful ministries ministries. We have to be about preaching and teaching and proclaiming the truth of who Jesus is. You won't be well liked by some, but the Lord will love what's coming out of your mouth. He will write everything down in a book in heaven, and you and him will go over it together, and he'll give you a reward for staying faithful to preach his word. And that's just not from a platform, guys. That's to your families at the dinner table. That's to your daughters and sons as you're in the car with them. That's to their friends. Whatever Facebook, Twitter, social media presence you have, use your words to draw people to Jesus. Use your words to speak well of him because that's what Jesus is doing. He's preaching the good news to the poor. Let's go on. And Jesus says this. Verse 6. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now this is an important point. Now what I mean by this is, is the disciples of John, they could have gone, okay, you're God, you're raising people from the dead, you're opening blind eyes, it says you're going to let the prisoners go free in Isaiah 61. Would you do that? (laughs) John's in prison. Would you confront Herod? Would you confront Rome? Would you do the Messiah thing and a sin on your throne and let the prisoners go free? But Jesus is telling them, Guys, don't be offended by my leadership. Don't be offended by the way I choose to lead this thing. Don't be offended that John's not getting out of prison. I think Jesus knows John is going to give his life as a martyr. And he's telling these disciples, don't be offended that I didn't release him from prison. Receive me as the Lord and follow my leadership. Amen? Everyone in Israel was expecting the Davidic king Messiah to establish his rule and reign. I mean, when you look at Daniel chapter 2, and when you look at the four empires that were going to arise, and at that fourth empire, the stone was going to come down from heaven and crush all empires, the Roman Empire was the fourth empire. They were waiting for it. They were expecting it. This is going to happen, and Jesus is going to lead us to victory. I think that was probably some of the disappointment that Judas encountered that caused him to betray Jesus. But he wasn't listening to the words of Jesus. He wasn't hearing, no guys, I have to die first for your sins. It's going to do me no good and you no good if I establish my kingdom on the earth with a bunch of sinful people that cannot receive my kingdom. You have to have your sins Washed. You have to have an atoning sacrifice that is perfect. So I have to do this first. 
Blessed are those who are not offended because of my leadership, because of the way I choose to lead my kingdom. Now, guys, this, I've gone back to this verse. I've prayed this verse over me in seasons where I don't understand what the Lord is doing. I say, Lord, let me not be offended by your leadership. I surrender. I am yours. However you want to lead my life, I am yours. And don't let me get offended because the way I think you should do things isn't the way you're doing things. Amen? We all have to engage with that reality, right? His thoughts really aren't our thoughts at times. His ways really aren't our ways. But you know what you can do? You can trust in the goodness of God over your life. You can trust that he wants to produce in you a harvest that is 30 and 60 and 100 fold. It says in this life, but guess what? Also in the age to come. He's thinking about your eternal destiny when he humbles you at times and disciplines you at times. He's going, oh, that's not good. That's not good that that's in their life. That's not good. I got to get it out. I got to get it out. Why? Because I want eternal reward for them. I want the best for them. I want the goodness for them. When he passed by Moses and said, Moses, you got to know this about me. I'm gracious. I'm compassionate full of tender mercy and love for my people. That's who I am. So when you get offended at the Lord's leadership, which we all have to wrestle through this, the writer of Hebrews, actually in Hebrews chapter 12, brings up Proverbs chapter 3. My son, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. And then he goes on this beautiful exposition of the discipline of the Lord. And then he says, at the end of that, he says in, uh, let's put up Hebrews 12, 15. He says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no, one, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. Now that, let no root of bitterness spring up in your heart flows from a passage in Hebrews of saying, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. Know that it's for your good and receive it. When we don't receive the discipline of the Lord in our life, we despise it. Okay? So that's probably a whole other sermon, but let's keep going. And as they went away, this is verse 17, or, or 7. We're not that far yet. And as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Verse 9. What did you go out to see? I tell you, a prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face, and you will prepare, and he, who will prepare your way, your way before you. So Jesus speaks of John. He's more than a prophet. He's the prophet of prophets. He's actually the prophet that's going to transition into the new covenant. How would you like to be the last one to proclaim the Messiah is coming and he comes and you're a part of a transitional generation? Moses was a part of a transitional generation. Pharaoh, something new is happening. You've got to let these people go. They've got to get to Horeb and worship God. He was a part of a transitional generation. John was a prophet, and he was transitioning a generation into the worship of God through Jesus. Let's keep going. There's fun things to say about that, but we don't have a lot of time. Verse 11. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Has that ever just like boggled your mind? I mean, there's so many times I read this verse as a young man and I tried to explain it away. That can't be true. Because <laughs> I truly feel like the least in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? <laughs> I'm 19, 20, 21 years old. I had a hard time believing this verse. Jesus, you're comparing me to John 
the Baptist. The greatest prophet of the old covenant, but in the new covenant, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Guys, do we know what we have access to? You know what it said of John the Baptist? It said, all Judea and all Jerusalem, I think this is in Mark chapter 1, all Judea and all Jerusalem left the comforts of their home, went to the wilderness to hear him preach, and they repented at his preaching. I've never done that, right? (laughs) But the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. This has to wake us up. This has to make us go, not, not wake us up to like get big ministries, but wake us up to go, what do we have access to by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? What do we have access to by the veil of Jesus' flesh being ripped into? And we have access into the most holy place. John didn't have that, guys. What do we have access to? And how are we being faithful to that access? Amen? I don't want to stand, you know, on the glassy sea worshiping the Lord and John the Baptist walks up to me and hits me over the back of the head and like, what did you do with your life? You had the indwelling spirit, that spirit that descended on Jesus when I baptized him. You had that inside of your heart and you didn't talk to him. Whoo. That's, this is my conviction, okay? <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir here. You had the word of God before you, and you had the anointing. 1 John chapter 2. You had the anointing dwelling inside of you to teach you all things. I had to wait on the voice in the wilderness. I had to wait to be communicated to. You get access through the word, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit to a way greater greater revelation than I had. And you have power To walk in it, you have power to distribute it. The greatness of the power that we get to walk in, that Ephesians 1 greatness of his power, is greater than what John the Baptist had. Even as I'm saying this, I can't believe it. Like, I'm like, really? Really? But it's true. We have to believe that that scripture is true. Oh, man. I do want to hit the end of this chapter. So let's just skip through, yeah, just keep going, verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, there's much debate about this verse. I just want to say this. I I really, as I've studied this, as I've looked at this for years, the best way, I think, to understand this is the kingdom of God allows a violent pursuit And those who have a violent pursuit of the kingdom of God lay hold of it. We need a violent pursuit. We need eagerness to arise in our heart concerning the kingdom of God. Let's keep going. Verse 13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. That's a prophecy found from Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, every time you hear that in Scripture, you want to pay attention to what Jesus is saying. Jesus was telling that crowd that the ages are transitioning. Not the ages. The covenants are transitioning. They are part of a brand new day. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse Verse 16. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sing a dirge and you did not mourn. Now it's interesting that we're talking about the new song. Responding to the new song. What the Lord was speaking to Mike. That you're going to sing my song. This verse, Jesus is saying, I came... And this children said, Jesus, you didn't join in to the song we were singing. You didn't join in to our song. You didn't join in to our voice. And what Jesus is saying here is, guys, I'm not supposed to join in with your song. You're supposed to join in with my song. 
I'm writing the lyrics to the new song that's going to be sung for all eternity, and you're saying we didn't respond to you. No, 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 no. Jerusalem, Judea, all of Israel, it's time to respond to me. I'm singing a song. Amen? Let's keep going. Verse 18. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and cinders. And cinders? And sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. So he's putting himself and John into the picture. And saying, guys, your accusation over John's life and your accusation over my life, we're going to see who's right. Wisdom, the wisdom John walked in, the wisdom I am walking in is going to be justified by what comes after us. The wisdom of John's ministry that drew so many people to repentance and then those same large crowds begin to follow Jesus. The wisdom of preaching repentance and the wisdom of following Jesus is going to be justified in the future, Jesus is telling them. And then we're going to skip the next verses. Verse, we're skipping verses 20 through 24. Jesus denounces these cities that most of his public ministry had been in. In verse 20 and 24, the verses we're skipping. He's denouncing them. He's saying, guys, I did so many good works in you. If I would have done the good works in you, Capernaum, that I did, or if I would have done the good works in Sodom and Gomorrah that I did in you, Capernaum, they would have repented with sackcloth and ashes. That's a pretty strong statement from the God who called down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, <laughs> from the God who had Abraham intercede. What if there are 45? What if there are 30? What if there, what if there are just 10? He got them down to just 10. He said, if I would have done the works in Sodom and Gomorrah that I did in you, Capernaum, they would have repented. But he says, but woe to you for not coming to me. And I think Jesus is addressing the leadership of those three cities. Because there's ample proof that many actually came to him from those three cities. But the leadership, the synagogue rulers, those that were in authority, they didn't call him the Messiah. And he's saying, woe to you. But then he switches Voice. He switches modes, and he, and he starts thinking of those that have repented, that have accepted him. And he goes into 25. This is just wonderful. I love this. He says, at that time, Jesus declared, and he begins to pray publicly. Oh, I would have loved. Well, I mean, we have the prayer, so that's pretty good, right? <laughs> but every time in Scripture you get Jesus praying publicly, or you get Jesus teaching us how to pray, don't read fast through those passages, okay? I want to pray like the Son of God prays. I want to pray like my great high priest that is at the right hand of God sat down at the right hand of God for me. I want to pray like he prays. Amen? So here's how Jesus prays. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. Now, this term wise and understanding, think of those who are prideful. Think of the, the verse in Proverbs 3 that we've been in, those who are wise in their own eyes, who aren't acknowledging the Lord in all of their ways, who aren't trusting in the Lord, but they are being wise in their own eyes. Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you hide things from those who are wise in their own eyes, and you reveal them to little children. He's comparing his disciples. He's comparing those who are following him. And he's comparing them to that childlike faith. You reveal them to those who approach you as little children. Yes, Father, for such is your gracious will. Some translations say, yes, Father, for such was your good pleasure. Guys, it is the Father's good pleasure pleasure to reveal things to the humble. It was his good pleasure to see Jesus in the form of God, not choose equality with God as something to be held on to for his own advantage, but for your advantage, he laid down his equality with God and he became a man. And he took 
the form of a servant. The one who was in the form of God took the form of a slave. Did you know that? That is unbelievable. And Jesus is telling us here, the Father loves it. And the Father reveals things to those who lay down their lives like that, who come to him as little children. And so, let's move on. Verse 27. Now, I really think Jesus could be still in the place of prayer here, okay? He's thanking the Father, just the last verse, and then he transitions his language, but I think he's still talking to the Father. Now, you could think in your mind he might turn to the crowd and begin to say this to them, but there's no break in the prayer. He begins to talk to his Father, and it's just red letters until it ends. Does your Bible have red letters until it ends? My Bible has red letters until it ends. And when you look at this prayer in Luke 10, it's very similar. It doesn't end with, come to me, all you're weary, but it's the same prayer. I actually think Jesus probably prayed this prayer more than one time because of where its placement is in Matthew and where its placement is in Luke chapter 10. Have you ever been around someone and you prayed with them over a season and you can almost guarantee what they're about to pray? Because they're crying out for it and they're so excited about it. We have, you know, weeks that go by in this prayer room, and we're all like, I, like I, I pretty much know what Mike's about to pray. And he pretty much knows what I'm about to pray, because we're just so excited about it, you know? Guys, I think for three years, Jesus was praying, Father, I thank you that you hide these things from those who are wise in their own eyes, in their own eyes and you give them to little children. And then he goes on. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now what if Jesus is still praying? Again, his language changes a little bit. But now picture Jesus with his eyes closed, thinking of you, saying the next verse. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and I am lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now I'll do this in the place of prayer. I'll take the authority that God has. Jesus just said, I have all authority. (laughs) It's all been given to me and I get to choose to reveal the Father to whom I choose. Now, sometimes I take my authority in the place of prayer, and I'll be praying for somebody or for someone or for something, and I'll just kind of step in, my language will change a little bit, and I say, so-and-so, come into the kingdom. So-and-so's body, be healed. And I'm, I'm commanding now, I'm using the authority God has given me. What if Jesus, with eyes closed, is thinking of you, And he starts to use and invoke his authority. And he's saying, come to me, all who are heavy laden. Come to me. I will give you rest. Come to me. I think there's biblical precedence for it. I think you can also see it the other way. What I love is Jesus has a very similar tone to his prayer in John chapter 17. We actually just prayed it. Dan just prayed it in the prayer room back there. He's praying for those who will believe in the word of his disciples. He's like, Lord, I don't want just these 12. I want all those who are going to believe in their word. I want them to come to me that we may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also, those who are going to believe through the preaching of the apostles, may be one in us. So here he's declaring, or in Matthew 11, he's declaring, come to me. But in, in, in John 17, he's looking right to his father, and he's saying, Lord, I want them with me. Verse 24 of John 17 says this. This is how Jesus is praying for you. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Guys, I was just stuck in this this week. 
I want to come to you, Jesus. You're asking for me to come to you. I want to see your glory, Jesus. You're asking for me to see your glory. I want to be with you where you are, Jesus. You're asking for me to be with you where you are. Answer your prayer. Answer your prayer in my life. Answer your prayer in my children's life. Answer your prayer at the rock. Answer your prayer here in Castle Rock and the front range. Let us come to you. Let us be with you where you are. And let us behold the glory of God. Amen. And then Jesus goes on. He says this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Guys, I agree. This is Alignment Sunday. To be in alignment with Jesus, we have to first come to him. You know who comes to him? The humble. You know who comes to him? The childlike. You know who comes to him? The thirsty. You know who comes to him? The hungry. There's a coming for initial salvation, but guys, there is a continual lifestyle of coming to Jesus for everything. He says, Learn from me. You can ask Jesus about anything. He knows it. He created it. He says, learn from me. It's like the Queen of Sheba going to Solomon and asking him and testing him with hard questions, and she walks away going, he answered every question that I had. And the order of his house and the order and the wisdom that came from him took my breath away. That's what it says. Jesus is the one that is greater than Solomon. He actually says that about himself. One greater than Solomon is here. Guys, he wants to take our breath away. He wants us to come to him in all things. He wants us to align himself, align ourselves with him. He wants us to take his yoke upon us. It's that picture of the oxen training a younger oxen, and they're plowing the field, and the younger oxen's right by the older oxen, but All the weight is being pulled by that older oxen. He wants to bear your burdens. Did you know that? He wants to bear your burdens. How good is he? How pleasant is he? And that we can ask him anything. Now, I think we have to come to him in a a few ways. One, we need to come to him and actually observe him. We need to spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer, know what He says, know who He is, know how He responds. When that woman is cast before Him in adultery and everything inside of us would want to judge her and He says, you who have not sinned, throw that first stone. Can you imagine that sternness in His face right there as He's protecting His daughter? He wants us to know how to respond to those situations. But guys, He also wants us to come to him with our questions. What what do I do in this season of my life, Lord? Come to me. I was just talking with someone before the service, and they were saying they need to make a decision today. We get the God that says, come to me. I want to tell you about that decision. Is that going to bring me glory or not? Will I be with you or not? Come to me. Learn from me and take courage and wait on me and do not make a move until I tell you to. That's the other side of coming to me. We don't get to come and just go, I don't know if I like that word. Or come and, "Uh, yeah, this is what Jesus said that. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, we need to hear. We need to listen. We need to be sheep that know his voice and follow him. If he's not moving, we're not moving. Amen? Amen. Amen.